for bearing for bearing with us through the storm. I did not have power until Saturday. I know many others uh, uh, were had a tough time as well. I hope everyone is safe and sound and all our trees are standing. Um, but it's good to be with you. So I'll give it just just another minute. I do see a person or two trickling on. Some familiar ah. names. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Amy, our uh, one of our trustees. Wendy, Sarah, um, Debbie Grew. Hello, everyone. Um, Chris and I uh, uh, presented for the uh, Osher Lifetime Learning Institute today slash Sage. I don't. I forget what Sage stands for. What does Sage stand for? I can't remember either. Yeah, it's something. Uh, and that was great. So we've been talking bird safe throughout the day, and we're going to keep on rolling. Uh, that time yeah, of year. That time of year. Uh, and I might as well um, just start going. Um, I guess knowing there was only so many people on, we should have done a meeting format so I could have seen everyone, but that's all right. Uh, we are in a webinar format. So what that means uh, is um, hopefully, I don't know if I've allowed everybody to talk to each other. Uh, attendees can chat with everyone. Okay, so now folks can use the chat if you'd like to. That'll make it a little easier. Unfortunately, using this webinar format, I can't, uh, it doesn't let me let you turn your video on, but oh well. Um, and uh, so uh, put questions in the chat or down below, and we'll be talking about what we're doing this spring. We are entering our, well, this is the end of our fourth season of route walking, correct? Yeah, we started in the fall of 2020. So this is wrapping up our fourth season of Bird Safe Maine, a program that uh, Chris and I are very excited about. Um, something we that that frankly I don't think we can believe we're still doing it. It's pretty awesome that this has really grown and taken uh, on a life of its of its own, and we've had really great successes here in Portland and around the state that we're excited to share with you. Um, the uh, this is the this would be the eighth edition of this particular webinar. Well, we where we. Uh, talk about what we're doing to potential new volunteers um, and see if they're interested in joining us uh, walking routes in the city or otherwise helping us out uh, with the work we do. So, um, Chris, anything you want to add before I jump in? Nope, go for it. All right, let me jump in and let me just make sure. Uh, let me do this. That's going to look weird for a second. Actually, give me one second. I'm flustered because of my internet. So let me just set this up a little different way quickly. Um, yeah, we'll do this. Okay. It's gonna look funky for a second, but then it's gonna look beautiful, right? You can see that, Chris? Yes, we can. All right, my friends. Hello, I'm Nick Lund from Maine Audubon, the state's oldest and largest wildlife conservation organization. Maine Audubon is great. Uh, if you're not a member, please be a member. Um, I'm joined by Dr. Chris Mayer from the beautiful campus of USM, which I was on today and I hadn't seen it. I, I used oh, to. Oh, yeah. I graduated from the University of Maine School of Law, which is right, uh, used to be down over near USM. And uh, beautiful campus, many more buildings. I guess it being 60 degrees um, helped things out a little bit. But um I'm joined by her. Uh, Chris and I are co-founders of Bird Safe Maine, which is a program that works to educate and take action on the problem of bird glass collisions. This is a uh, collaboration between Maine Audubon, the Portland Society for Architecture, USM, and Avian Haven. That's their logo up top. They are wildlife rehabilitators in Maine. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about birds that have collided with glass and died or are injured. This is a problem that the scientific community is just sort of waking up to in the past decade or so. Thanks uh, in part to groups like ours to, who are raising awareness and finding um, hard data, hard data uh, on the streets uh, and in our, uh, you know, on our, on our back decks. You know, it may seem like a niche problem or not a big deal, but it is a big deal. Um, this is a slide from the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, which shows human-caused um, uh, avian mortality around the country. So uh, reasons that birds have died because of humans. 
And a couple things you want to point out at the top there is uh, building glass collisions. So Scott Loss is the um, scientist who's done a lot of great studies about estimating bird, you know, uh, about bird glass collisions, including estimating numbers. The estimated range of uh, bird deaths per year in this country only from glass collisions is between 365 million and 988 million with a median guess of about 600 million. That's birds, individual birds per year. So uh, what that means is on the low end, about 1 million birds per day are dying after colliding with windows. To put that in context a little bit, that is um, one, you know, second place basically in estimated um, uh, bird deaths from human causes behind cats, which are an exponentially greater uh, 1.4 billion on the low end, billion with a B. Um, but compared to, say, land-based wind, wind turbines, um, of which there are uh, about 78,000 wind turbines in the country, um, you can see that only about between uh, 140 and 230, uh, 100, you know, 230,000 birds, uh, which is still a lot of birds, not, a, not something we're negating, but um, many, many thousands and millions fewer than, than building glass collisions. This is a big, big problem. In our urban areas, it peaks during migration, which we are about to embark on right now. It's actually, it's started already. Um, spring migration, the a, a birder's favorite time of year, the time we dream about, wait for all year. We suffer through boring cold March for just to get to April and especially May. Um, this is when you have birds on the move, right? So uh, three and a half billion birds um, passerine birds mostly um, fly from their wintering grounds in the Southeast U.S. or the Caribbean or Mexico, or Central America or South America up into the U.S. Um, about two and a half billion of those fly through up to the boreal forests of Canada where they're, where they're going to breed. In the fall, there are four billion that come out of Canada. Of course, they all had babies over the summer. And so they are they're more in the fall than the spring. Work their way south. Through the U.S., they pick up about a billion more in the U.S. and work their way further south to their breeding grounds. This is a major movement of species um, and uh, a real sort of incredible natural phenomenon. Um, the landscape that they are moving over looks a whole lot different now than it did 100 years ago, 200 years ago, right? We have, uh, humans have changed the landscape that these birds are migrating through uh, and made it much more hazardous for them to get on their way. Um, Basically, the way it works is that birds take off and fly at nighttime. Uh, it's There are fewer predators at night. Uh, they can use the stars for navigation. It's usually calmer. Uh, and so they fly at night. And when the sun comes up, they come down. They come down wherever they get to. They don't know where they are. They don't sort of have a goal in mind necessarily. They get to where they get to and they come out. That could, they come, they may come out at a big, beautiful national park or forest and have plenty of room to to find food and safety. They may come out in an urban area and there's a whole lot of the urban areas on the East Coast. If they find themselves in an urban area, they find themselves without a lot of trees and uh, places to um, to take cover, without a lot of food. And they have to sort of fend for themselves, find their way to, to better habitat or ride the day out until nighttime it comes again, they can take off again. Um, one thing they are increasingly encountering when they come out of the sky is glass. So glass is the um, number one, the amount of glass on a building is the number one predictor for how many birds will collide. Um, glass is uh, a fascinating object. It's, uh, it's not something that is found in nature, not something that birds are used to, of course, and um, a, a, a substance that tricks them in a number of ways. Uh, it is reflective, right? So as birds are flying along, they see the sky uh, reflected in glass windows and they think they're flying through the sky. They don't know what buildings are. They don't know to look out for glass. And so they think they're flying to safety and they instead collide with glass. Actually, probably more often, they think they're flying from vegetation to vegetation. So as glass reflects vegetation, um, these are areas that especially small birds uh, are, are looking to move into to find safety and food. And so they're darting through open areas back to vegetation. They see what they think is a safe place to, to, to be. And instead it's a, it's a glass window. So glass is reflective, but it's also transparent, right? Um, this, um, I was introduced to this work when I worked in Washington, DC for a group called Lights Out DC. And what we did then in um, you know 2012 or so, 
Well, as we walked around the streets of DC early in the mornings, trying to find births, um, we were, uh, the science was even less settled at that point. And we, we didn't know what it was about certain buildings that would, would be dangerous to birds. So we were just trying to find out everything we could. This, this building, the Thurgood Marshall Judiciary Building uh, near Union Station in DC was one of the most dangerous on our route. Um, the reason is because this building is basically two big square stone buildings connected by this big glassed in atrium there. And the atrium at nighttime, here it is at nighttime, is lit up from within. And there are these trees planted in the middle of the atrium. The trees are, you know, a beacon basically for these migratory birds. Uh, and they come and they hit the glass, which is, is, is invisible when lit from within. Um, lights are also a factor here. Um, lights are, uh, we know that lights contribute to, um, to uh, or play a role in uh, attracting birds. Um, this is the uh, tribute in light, it's called, in New York City. And all those little, those white specks up there are birds that are illuminated here. Um, it's a little, they're, they're, the science is still evolving about what exactly it is that, that brings um, birds to light. The most likely candidate is that insects, as we know, are attracted to lights and birds are coming in to find the insects. Um, but studies have proven time and again, especially at this tribute in light, that, uh, so what they do here is they turn it off and on every, every um, after a period of time. When the lights are off, there's basically uh, an even distribution of migratory birds throughout uh, the sky. This is, of course, in September when there are birds moving south. When the lights are on, there is a massive collection of thousands of birds that come to the light. These are super bright lights. So light does play a role, um, but glass has, has shown to be the, the, the most dangerous aspect of this. And so what we do at BirdSafe Maine is trying to is work on this problem uh, in Portland. Um, we'll talk about that a little more specifically uh, later, but um, we are advocating for solutions. There's all kinds of things you can do to make a building that is safe for birds. Um, these buildings are all glass. This building on the right uh, has a cool metal screen around it. This building on the left has a combination of sort of um, fritted glass and frosted glass. Um, this building here is the Javits Center in New York City. This is this same building. This, for the longest time, was the deadliest building in New York City, as you may imagine, um, for bird strikes. This building has a number of extremely dangerous features. Of course, it's clad in glass, so it, it reflects uh, the sky. It reflects habitat that you can see down here. Um, it has a number of, uh, it has pass-through glass, so where birds can look in one window and see out another window, like over here. I don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen, but um, you, uh, uh, you can see through though. So pass through is dangerous. Glass corners are dangerous where a bird can see, like right here, can see um, through to the other side through glass. So this building is like a perfect storm of, of uh, the worst bird safe practices. Um, they worked with uh, New York City Audubon to retrofit the entire building with this particular glass. It's called fritted glass where uh, ceramic dots are printed on the, the pane before it's installed. And this building, even though it still looks like this, so this is a post retrofit picture, it still has all the, the stuff you want of a glass building. It's all lit from within and there's lots of, um, you know, sunlight, of course, uh, cut their strikes by more than 90% after those fritz were fitted. So um, there are products work. Um, all kinds of other products out there. These are acid etched glasses, glass. These are other panels. Anything that you can do, and this is just general, this isn't really, but anything you can do to let a bird know that there's a window there is going to work, right? That's all you need to do is give a bird some sort of visual clue that this thing is not the sky or habitat, but is a, a dangerous window. So it could be fancy patterns. It could be uh, not having gigantic windows. Right, so brick buildings are a fantastic bird safe tool. It could be insect screens that you put on your windows. It could be mullions. It could be other patterns, anything, paint that uh, kids or artists paint, um, hanging cords, anything you can you can put on the outside of your window to to increase its visibility to birds and uh, makes it bird safe. So um, in Maine, and I should say, probably first should have said earlier, um, this. This uh, webinar is basically broken up into two halves. So one is um, people who want to volunteer uh, in Portland, 
Uh, and in a few slides, I will transition to more Portland specific information. And then the first half, which I'm talking now, is sort of a general overview for people who are interested generally, um, but may not be able to volunteer in Portland. Um, so just so we so we know that. But um, so Bird Safe Maine was founded uh, between Chris and I four years ago. Um, and uh, the Portland Society of Architecture to do something about this, to raise awareness, to try to protect birds. It's what we do at Maine Audubon. Um, and we've had some great success there. Um, we are, um, there's a lot of sort of angles in to the education piece, especially. This bird safe issue is not something that there's a lot of awareness of, especially among architects. So folks graduate architecture school without knowing anything about the dangers of glass. So we're really out here to, to educate them. And we've had a number of successes already. Um, this is um, L.L. Bean's new headquarters in Freeport. Uh, we worked with them to uh, install about 19,000 square feet of these decals on their back windows facing a big forest back there. Um, after they built this new building and then some employees um, were complaining and having a hard time doing work because so many birds were crashing into their office windows. Um, we installed 19,000 square feet of these dots back there, the largest retrofit that we're aware of in New England. Um, and um, a fantastic job. I mean, there, there are no laws in Maine that require uh, any company to take action on, on bird safe architecture. And so L. Bean did this because they're a good company and, and wanted to do right by their employees. We've had similar successes working with um, the Memic company in the, the building they occupy in downtown Portland. Um, we work with um, Saddleback Mountain in uh, uh, you know, up north on a new lodge at their building to make it bird safe for Bicknell's Rush and other birds. Um, employees at Bigelow Labs uh, in East Booth Bay work to put decals all over their building and 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 more and growing numbers. Um, so we've had a lot of success sort of tackling some projects. We've also fairly incredibly um, had success in the state legislature. Um, last session, um, Representative Sophie Warren from Scarborough introduced a bill. This is after we've been working for three years and had gotten a lot of the word out there to folks in Maine. She introduced a bill um, to deal with, you know, to start the process of dealing with um, bird safe architecture. And it got passed, believe it or not. Maine Audubon's advocacy in action got this bill passed. Maine is now one of just four states in the country that has taken statewide action on bird safe architecture. Uh, this bill, LD 670, uh, uh, doesn't require anything, but we're going down the process of developing guidelines for bird safety in the use of public buildings. So really, our idea here is to, to just raise awareness. If you can get to an architect before they've built a building and you can get them to think about bird safety, it's much easier and much cheaper to build a build safe building than it is to build a Javits Center and come back and replace all the glass. And so this... this um, Legislation is a really incredible step in that direction to um, get people thinking more and more about um, uh, bird safe architecture in Maine. The other thing we are working on is an ordinance in the city of Portland. Um, there's only a couple states that have taken statewide action, but there's about two dozen or so municipalities around the country, including big cities like New York and, and Washington, D.C., um, that have taken uh, past uh, bird safe ordinances for their cities. Um, and that's something we are working on uh, in the city of Portland. So um, over um, the summer of 2022 and uh, into 2023, and now still going, uh, we pulled together uh, a, a big group of architects in Portland to work, to understand what the latest best practices were from these municipal ordinances and design our own for Portland. Um, and we're very proud of this ordinance. Um, we uh, we're about to take it in front of the city council, um, but things got delayed and then, then the election happened and now the city council looks different. So we, we are um, resetting a little bit. Um, tomorrow evening, 24 hours from now, I will be probably waiting to talk, but maybe talking um, before <laughs> to the uh, Sustainability and Transportation Committee of the Portland City Council um, to, to re-engage their support and then hopefully take this to, to the council again. Um, we're very excited and optimistic about this effort and um, you know, uh, continue to do great things. Um, there's a whole lot I haven't mentioned. Chris, do you want to jump in and, and say anything um, about the other work we're doing? Um, I think you're good so far. I didn't know if you wanted um, any to show any results or anything like that if we were, you know, just to show what we found in the past because I've got slides queued up, but I don't know. Okay. Where we're, yeah, just um, let me do that in a minute after I show yeah. the map. 
No okay, problem. Great. Yeah. Um, so we do tons of stuff. We have developed a curriculum that is uh, being deployed in schools, most notably Yarmouth Elementary School, which just responded by installing permanent measures on some of their windows out there. Uh, we are working to contact installers to help understand these new products. We're doing a lot of great stuff. Um, and we need help. If you want to help out, um, please uh, let us know. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can help out that doesn't involve volunteering on the streets of Portland. Um, the number one way is just to let us know if you find strikes, right? So this in migration is an urban problem because birds are finding themselves in cities where they're usually not. But but bird strikes are a four season problem uh, at residences uh, in, in your houses. So if you have a window um, that you find uh, birds on, please let us know. Here's some information here about where to send a photograph um, and a date and your address. Um, that way you can put it in our big database of, uh, of bird strikes. If the bird is injured, you can call Diane, our, our volunteer from Avian Haven, and she'll um, come help you out with that. Um, and then we we'd be happy to talk with you about different products if you're interested in, in treating your windows. Um, you can also become involved in other ways if you want. Chris and I are on the leadership team here at BirdSafe Maine, which works, uh, meets regularly to talk about these issues and, and move forward. And uh, we're just a great group. So um, that is the statewide portion of the presentation. And now I will move into the sort of bread and butter and what we're talking about today, which is walking around walking around the streets of Portland. Um, when we started this program in 2020, um, the idea was to try to ground truth the science, right? So there are studies out there that show a lot of things about how birds strike in cities, which species strike most, most often, what times they strike. And then most importantly, um, that birds strike more often against glass buildings than they do against say a brick building, right? So our goal was just to ground truth that. Let's get some folks out there walking the streets and see what we can see. So what we've done um, every uh, you know uh, every fall and spring migration since 2020 um, for six weeks generally in the spring and for eight weeks um, walking every morning in the fall is walk a route throughout the city of Portland that runs past a, a number of you know sort of new glass heavy buildings and then maybe more traditional less glass buildings and see what we can see are we going to find birds we're we not going to find birds um guess what spoiler alert we found birds we find lots of birds um we have proven everything that we have set out to prove basically with this project in Portland um we have found um exactly the birds that the science taught us to expect on exactly the days that they taught us to expect. And we find them most often against glass buildings. Period, simple as that. This work is the basis of what of everything we've done. Um, the images that we have, um, the, the ground truthing from the streets is what enables us to go to this place like the city council and say, this is a problem. Look, we found it. Um, this is what we do when we volunteer. We walk around, we don't wear masks anymore. Um, this was from a Portland Press Herald article in 2020. You can wear a mask if you want to. Um, but we walk around and we look for birds uh, on the streets. Um, this is as simple as that. We have lots of great volunteers. Our, our best might be the Kallenberg kids um, who um, are, come in from Cousins Island uh, usually every Sunday to, to find birds and they find a ton of them. Um, and we do find a, a ton of them. It's it's uh, can be difficult at times. Um, I would say on average, especially in the spring, we find, as Chris will, will tell you in a minute, we generally find fewer birds in the spring than we do in the fall uh, for a number of reasons. But, um, and sometimes you don't find any birds. That's that's common, especially in the spring, uh, but sometimes you do. And um, that can be everything from this white-throated sparrow here to this uh, Swainson's thrush uh, in the hands there to the common yellow throat stunned in, in the hands there to this uh, Savannah sparrow upside down on the bottom. Um, this is our route and potential volunteers um, can uh, uh, will we'll, uh, get to know this. Our first walk is it's Thursday the 18th, right, Chris? Yeah, thank you, Amy, for correcting me that over email. Um, uh, Thursday, April 18th is our first walk. Um, our, our tradition is to do a group walk. So we invite all the volunteers who might want to join us for the year out on the, uh, the streets. We start here at, at Ocean Gateway down off uh, Thames, Thames Street, off Commercial Street. Um, and we start there and we walk this route. It's about two miles. It takes about an hour. 
um, can be more or less depending on how fast you walk or how many birds you find. Um, this takes us by, past a number of um, sort of glass heavy buildings, including some of our traditionally most dangerous buildings um, like this building, the Wex building or the Sun Life building here. Um, it brings you back around past plenty of you know less dangerous buildings and then back to Ocean Gateway. Um, it's uh, it's fun, dare I say, in the spring, uh, we get out early in the morning. This is always a difficult part of this conversation. We start at 5.30 in the morning in the spring. The idea here is that you want to get birds as they're coming out of the sky from their migrations, and you want to get them before the gulls get to them. Gulls eat birds that hit the sidewalks. Um, if you're a gull and you're used to eating whatever you can get your little beak around, um, a nice fresh songbird is a meal for you. And so it's very common um, for us to chase, you know, be in a foot race with gulls to get to a bird. Um, and we miss uncountable birds um, that gulls get to before we can get there. So we get out there early, but you are done early and you can get home in time for a nice restful coffee or whatever, another nap maybe before you go. Um, let me turn it over to Chris now, and uh, she will talk uh, about some of the things we found. Right. Let's see if I can share and find some more slides. So just for those people who maybe want to know sort of what we have found, let's see, hopefully this will, uh, I can't see it down there at the bottom. There we go. Oh, come on. All right, let's try this instead. Okay. Um, so this is just a little bit of data um, to kind of show you what we have found over the last um, three spring seasons, um, just showing the mean number of birds here, um, starting at April 18th. Um, it starts out kind of slow, and these are just um, error bars to give you an idea of the variability. But it's usually, as Nick mentioned, we don't see as many birds in the spring as we do in the fall, partly because these birds have all um, made it through a winter um, and, uh, and have migrated safely down to their wintering grounds and are heading back. So they're, they have some experience and, um, and so just, or, and they just maybe haven't made it all the way through. So fewer birds, but they're heading north. And, um, but what you see too, is that there's this peak right here, which is exactly when we expect to see a peak, given what we know about migrants through, through Maine um, in about middle of May. Um, and then it tapers off again there. So, um, but yes, but it's pretty steady um, leading up until that peak. And then um, these data are just kind of showing you um, a what we find and b kind of what you can expect in terms of the three categories of birds that we what we do find. So um, first thing I want to show you over the four fall seasons, um, you notice that we do see more birds in the fall than we do in the spring. But spring is also um, you know we are finding birds. And there is variability from year to year. Fall 2022 was a particularly bad year. Not exactly sure where, why, weather may have had um, something to do with it. It's hard to know. Maybe there was a big boom on the breeding grounds that year too, and just a lot of birds were produced. But you also notice that there's three categories of birds that we find. And by far, the most birds that we find are found dead. So a little over half, about 57% of the birds that we find are dead on the sidewalk. That's in the green bars here. Um, and then there's also birds though that are stunned. So these are still alive and they're in various states of distress, we'll say. Um, some birds are, um, you know, given enough time, will probably recover and fly away. And sometimes they do that right in front of you. They just take off. Um, if we do, when we do find stunned birds, um, we, um, if you're comfortable doing this, we um, will kind of move them to a secure location, just maybe under a bush someplace. So they're not right out in the middle of the sidewalk where, Somebody could potentially step on them or a gull might find it easier to get them. Um, and so just to give them a safe place to sort of recover. Many of those birds, unfortunately, probably do succumb to their injuries, um, blood trauma. It, it's hard to tell what has actually happened to those birds. And then the third category of birds that we see are strikes. So this is when a bird just bounces against the glass, hits the window, and then flies off. It can be really challenging to identify those birds, but we do count those as well. And then um, in terms of what birds we find, oh, well, let's try that again. There we go. Um, by far, the vast majority of birds that we find are songbirds. Again, that's given, that's not surprising given that we're looking at these um, walking around during migration when these birds are moving through. 
Um, we found something like 23 different families of birds, but by far most of them are sparrows and warblers. And again, that's partly because those are the birds that are coming through Portland um, at that time of the year. And so it, that's what we expect to see. That's what we other people have found as well. And if we drill down a little bit more and look at those two families, we see that within the warbler group, um, let's see, it's about 19 species of birds that we found. Um, and common yellow throats are by far the most vulnerable. Again, that's what other folks have found too. These common yellow throats are, are kind of shrubby. They like shrubby areas, low down. So when they kind of take off from, um, from their perches, they're gonna hit those low places where the glass may be reflecting back at them. So um, you see quite a few common yellow throats. Um, but what's also interesting based on what we found is there's not an insignificant number of black pole warblers that strike buildings. And that's important um, to know because that's a threatened species in Maine. And about 6% of, um, of the birds that hit, of the warblers are black poles in there. Um, if we look at the sparrows, it's the white-throated sparrows that are the most vulnerable by far here. About half of the birds, half of the sparrows that we find are white-throated sparrows. Um, and again, all the sparrows are those kind of low, um, uh, they like to hang out low in the vegetation. Um, swamp sparrows are another um, vulnerable species. And you also notice that um, there's a lot of unknowns in the strike category here. And that's because um, sparrows are notoriously challenging to identify even when they're sitting on the sidewalk right in front of you. But then you see this bird strike, you could tell it's a sparrow and you're not sure which one it is. Um, so, so that kind of gives you an idea of some of the birds that we have found. And where we find birds, so we told you when and which birds, we find birds all along the route at various places, a total of about 77 different locations now with, that we've tallied up. Um, but as Nick said, there's um, some bird buildings that are much more deadly than others. And it comes down to basically six buildings that are taking, um, that are counting for about 75% or three quarters of all the bird collisions. Um, right, so we have six buildings that are the biggest culprit, and I'll just quickly mention the top three, which Nick has kind of already alluded to. This is um, a new building, well, relatively new building now, on Thames Street down in the Portland Four Complex, that area. Um, this is our third place birds, uh, third place building in terms of birds. And some of the reasons for that is because it's right along the water. Um, so chances are if birds are following the shoreline, they're going to kind of settle down in this area. There's habitat right adjacent to this. It's along the East End Trail. So there's habitat nearby and there's just a lot of glass on this building that reflect the sunlight, especially as the sun's coming up. Um, another building um, that's been a problem, um, about uh, one in four birds are, are hitting here is 261 Commercial Street. And some of the reasons for this is because of just this design of the building and the habitat that's nearby. So this is an alley that runs between the building and the, a parking garage for the Portland Harbor Hotel. And there's some really tall trees here that are planted literally on top of the parking garage and probably stick out like a little beacon for birds that are looking for a place to settle and rest during the day. The unfortunate thing is that then when they go to take off, they run right into this reflective building next to there and then drop down onto the alley behind it. So again, and it's also right across the street from the water as well. So combination of things that are kind of lethal with all that glass there. And then the top building that um, has been responsible for birds along our route, again, very close in number, about one in four is um, this building at the corner of um, Hancock and Thames. Again, it's directly across the street from Ocean Gateway Terminal. So it's right near the water. Um, there's nice habitat around it. And then one of the features of this building in the back, on the back side of it, away from the waterfront, is this little courtyard here, which is an L-shaped kind of courtyard that acts as a funnel and sort of can trap the birds in there and makes it hard for them to get out, again, along with some nice plantings and just a lot of glass in that area. Um, and just real quick though, um, a little shout out, and Nick had mentioned this before, this is that um, building 261 Memick Street, which houses Memick, the insurance company. You see here, just looking at the percentage of birds found, you know, we find quite a few birds there, but there's been this interesting drop last fall. Um, in fall of 2023 in the number of birds we find there. And 
just to refresh your memory, this is what that habitat looks like. We've got the courtyard here with all those tall trees and this nice reflection there. Well, what happened in fall 2023 is that um, the Memic installed um, window treatments on Harris, put in some film. And you can see that, I think, in, in these slides. There are little dot patterns here um, on those windows. So they actually did treated that whole courtyard side of the building with those dot patterns. And there's a nice correlation between when that treatment went up and when we were seeing fewer birds strike. Now that install wasn't complete last fall. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we are heading back out there this spring in particular and walking the same route to just see now that that is complete, um, if we continue to see that drop in numbers, which would be um, a really cool thing to see. So I will stop sharing. And give, so that gives you an idea sort of, of of some of the things that we have found and some of the cool work that our um, our our data have already come to fruition on. All right, Nick, back to you. I'm going to unmute myself. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> we, we are finding things and we are doing great work and we'd love uh, you to work with us. Um, uh, I'll come back to this maybe because there's a great question from Amy Weikert in the chat about do we need do we ask the volunteers to identify the bird? No. <laughs> Uh, don't need you to identify the bird. Um, it's hard to identify birds and don't worry about it. Um, what we do ask you to do is take a picture. Um, taking a picture has been uh, a very important um, advocacy tool for us because photos of these birds are undeniable, right? It, these are sad, heart-wrenching pictures. And when they are on the street, you know where it is. And it's hard if you're a building owner or you know a city official to say, pretend this problem doesn't exist when you have a picture showing it. And so instead of, uh, you know, folks are welcome to identify birds if you want, but um, no, you just have to try to take a picture. Um, our, we had a, a fellow last summer who helped us with this work and she put together, uh, Katie Netland was her name, um, put together a great slide about, uh, a couple of slides about taking good pictures. And I'll just run through this very quickly. Um, what you want is clear, identifiable and evocative if possible. It flex your photojournalist muscles for this effort. Um, a picture like this is not going to change minds and hearts, probably. Um, it's not clear. I, I I would say white-throated sparrow or white crown sparrow down there. Um, not a super helpful picture, but this is, right? Um, it's less important for us to know exactly the building that it's at than to get a, a clear picture. This, of course, is a, a common yellow throat in its non-breeding plumage. Um, um, I'd say a male with the brightness of that, that, that yellow there. Um, um, but this is a, a sad, evocative, uh, clear, and identifiable picture. Um, so is this. This is Hazel Kallenberg, again, our, our mega volunteer. Um, this is the same bird after they collected it, um, you know, showing the human element, showing the concern there. Um, this is not really the ideal picture. Um, this happens all the time. Folks are, are not necessarily trained photographers, and sometimes it, it can be dark in areas. Um, but for a number of reasons, this this probably isn't going to move the advocacy needle for folks. Um, this is a Lincoln's sparrow. You can tell. Uh, I'll just we'll just talk about bird ID while we're here. You can tell that the buff on the breast here, the clear, the clean white down here, and these little streaks down here uh, indicate that this is a Lincoln sparrow, one of the most beautiful sparrows we have. Um, these are other clear identifiable. These are sort of commonly seen um, type of pictures. Um, this is a black pole warbler. This is among the trickier fall warblers that we get. And you can tell by the yellow feet here and um, that this is a, a black pole warbler. This is now a threatened species in Maine. Um, oh, something to keep our, our eyes on. Um, this again is a, a co another common yellow throat there. Um, for identi for identification, it helps if especially if you if you don't know the species or it's not maybe not clear to to get a few shots so we can see different identification features. Um, this shot here, the clear light really tells me, and especially this gray nape shows me this is a swamp sparrow here. Swamp sparrow is one of our most common bird. This is also a swamp sparrow, but much harder to tell, as you can see, just because of the because of the lighting. So anyway. Take pictures, please. That is the, the primary tool that we use and both to sort of get the word out and uh, talk to potential um, officials, but also to identify birds. So Chris, and, um, we ask folks to send us pictures that, uh, that you find when you're done for the day. And then Chris and I go through and, and make the identification so we're, so we're sure. 
Yep. And that's why, sorry, and multiple angles is helpful because there are different identifiers that we can use on different parts of the bird. So the sides, the back, the breast, those are all good. If, you know, turn, just moving the bird, turning it over to get those different angles is great. All right. So what does it, what does it look like to walk around? Um, it's fun. Believe it or not, it's fun. It's good exercise. You get to see the city before it wakes up and so you're out there. Uh, when they're, you can walk in the middle of the street, you can do whatever you want. It's fun. Um, here's what we do. Um, in, a, in a minute here, I'm going to send her, uh, I will send a, a, a Google spreadsheet around. I'll also email it around a little bit later that folks can use to sign up. Um, you can do whatever you want. You can do one day a season. Most people do uh, one day a week for the season, which ends up in the spring being six uh, mornings. Um, you, pick, you pick a morning and um, you'll see that there are slots for up to four volunteers. Um, you can communicate with those volunteers about how you're going to do it. Um, generally, what we ask is folks to start at the Ocean Gateway building down off Thames Street. There's plenty of parking there in the mornings. Um, and you walk that route in a um, counterclockwise fashion. Um, if you have four volunteers, though, or if you have any really any more than one volunteer, you can, as long as one person is walking the typical route, you can do other things. So we know that we miss birds because you've walked by the building already or, uh, you know, you didn't get there in time and a gull beat you to it. And so you could have, say, someone start up on Congress Street and you do sort of a double loop or you can have, you can walk in opposite directions and, and see what happens. Um, but generally, if it's just one person or you want to walk with two people, just do the, the regular route uh, and you just walk. You just walk. You walk and you look at the ground. Um, you'll know when you find a bird, but they also can be hidden in bushes and, and shrubberies and things out of the way. Um, when you find a bird, you have a couple options. If it's a dead bird, you start by taking photos and then make a record of the time you found it, the, the address you're at, um, species if you'd like to, and just get those photos. If you find a stunned bird, it's up to you how you want to react. There are different levels of injury for these birds. Some birds are uh, very mobile and will, will flit away from you and try to escape. Um, if that's happening, just let the bird go on its way. Um, if the bird, often we find birds clearly stunned and very injured, like this bird here, this um, this uh, white-throated sparrow is um, alive, but I, this that foot posture there with the fit with the um, the digit extended and the, the sort of closed eyes, this bird is in, in very rough shape. You have a couple options. You could call Avian Haven and Diane can come and, and take the bird and try to re rehabilitate it. Um, the, the, the truth of the matter is that it's pretty unlikely to, that a bird in this state uh, will be rehabilitated. There's often internal injuries from these uh, strikes and uh, it's it sometimes can be seen as a lot of effort um, into a bird that may not survive, but that's up to uh, the, you folks. Um, another option is to simply to gingerly pick up the bird and move it to an area that seems safer. Um, birds like this in the sidewalk are at risk of being stepped on, certainly eaten. And so moving it to uh, the cover of a bush or anywhere uh, that feels sort of safer and more out of the way to let the bird recover if possible um, is, a good, is a good bet. So that's what we ask. Um, for dead birds, um, we don't ask that you collect them or, and bring them with you. We generally um, move them away underneath a bush or uh, in any place that you want um, that is off the sidewalk. Um, we have in, in previous years worked with um, USM students who collected birds to do studies on them, but we simply don't have the sort of capacity to do that uh, at this point, unless Chris says, says different. Um, so no need to sort of bring the birds with you um, unless you want to start your own collection for whatever reason. And I, I won't ask any further questions about that. Um, that's how we do it. Um, when you're done, get some coffee and breakfast. Number one is that you can justify the expense because you are a good person. You've done a good thing and you're helping birds. Um, and then at some point during the day, email photos and the info to me and Chris, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, okay. The group walk is Thursday. Thank you, Amy. Thursday, April 18th at 5.30 a.m. I will not be there because I'll be on vacation. Sorry, not sorry, but Chris will be there. Um, it's fun to walk around together. You get to meet some of the other, other volunteers. And I will right now um, send the spreadsheet around that folks, if you're interested in signing up, um, can take a look and pick some days. Um, 
And and just gonna, I know this is a small group, but just for people while Nick's getting that ready. Um, so there's multiple columns in that spreadsheet. And the first column is um, we kind of have that person designated as our um, our team leader, our group leader for that day. So that person is kind of in charge of um, contacting other people, making sure who's going to be there and what time you're going to meet and all that kind of stuff. Because the sun does, as you know, changes what it comes up. And so um, our um, start time often will shift um, as the days get longer and we have to kind of race the birds out there. So, oh yes, good. And there's, you can see, there's Turn our group leader. Um, and so their job is to, like I said, make contact with everybody else. And there is a tab on there. So if you go down here, you see my thing going down, boom. There you go. Volunteer contact information, all of it is in here. Um, send a text, I don't know what this, is doing. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. Um, uh, so put your information in, and then uh, when you can see who's walking with you, um, like I'll uh, reach out to Marsha, and I know it's coming with me on April 30th, and we will just be like, "Hey, you you good? You're you're, you're still coming tomorrow? That's great. We'll be here. Uh, if there's a bunch of people, we can talk about whether we want to start at different areas or or just meet up." Because it can be kind of a pain if you're there waiting and you don't know if the person's coming, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, it's kind of iffy with weather. I mean, we do not walk this route when it's pouring down rain, yeah. um, just because we're not expecting birds out there. However, if it's sort of misty, foggy, or there's a threat of rain, sometimes it's just nice to sort of check in with everybody else on the team to to see, are you go or should we go, should we not go? And I said, there are some pretty dedicated volunteers who will walk even when we have showery weather. So that's why it's just also nice to be able to check in with everybody else that's on that day, that signed up for that day. Um, I send weekly updates to all the, the walkers to update on the progress. Um, another thing is to keep track of BirdCast, the migration forecasting tool from uh, Cornell, which really does a good job of giving us an indication of what we might find out there. So that is our spring 2024 presentation. Um, I saw some names in there already, and I'm very excited and grateful to you for doing that. Um, thank you. Um, are there any questions? If so, put them in the chat or the questions box, and we'll do them now. And if there are not, um, I leave you with my gratitude. And Chris, any parting words? Nope. Thank you, everybody, for your interest and for joining us um, on a Tuesday evening. And yes. we hope to see some of you on our group walk. Oh, we got a Q and I got somebody. Oh, last one. There we go. Um, yeah. Hope to see some of you on the group walk and we can teach you the route. Sure. Um, uh, if, a, if a day has four volunteers, you want to go anyway, is that OK? Absolutely. Go do whatever you'd like. Um, be in touch with the folks and they can say, um, uh, uh, they can tell you, you can, you can plan or figure out or all go together. It can be a fun social time as well. Um, I see uh, Lila, Layla, sorry about if I'm mispronouncing that. How do we get to the spreadsheet? Do you see the link uh, up above? Let me put it again. Um, here, I'll put that back in there. That is the link to the spreadsheet. Uh, so click on that and it'll bring you over and you can look at the days and see who else is walking then and find the day that works for you. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll be back in touch. I appreciate your time and your concern for birds and your willingness to do a good thing. Have a great night and we'll talk to you soon.